This is the first of three videos that deals with the policy implications of economic growth theory. It is based on the insights that we've gained in the lecture casts on the solo growth model, the ramsey kass koopmans model, the overlapping generations model, and in particular, all the models that deal with research and development based economic growth theory. In parts two and three, I will go more into the details of specific policies. In this part here, I provide a first overview. To start with, we've seen in the lecture casts on the stylized facts of economic growth and on the long run evolution of living standards that actually most of human history was not much more than a struggle to survive. 200 years ago, most people barely lived uh, above the subsistence level. People struggled to nourish themselves. Hygienic standards were bad. Life expectancy was um, even below the age of 30. Every second child died before reaching the age of five. And uh, it was really uh, a very, very a bad situation where only kind of uh, the elite and kings and um, so on, they enjoyed uh, high living standards, but the vast majority of the population did not. And even kings, uh, imagine you are a king 200 years ago uh, and compare this to the living standards that an average person enjoys nowadays in a rich country, then at least I would not want to uh, switch places. So, for example, um, you have uh, running water everywhere. Today you have heating systems. You um, uh, have a good healthcare system so that most of the illnesses are not a death sentence. Um, we have iPhones, the Internet. Uh, we can travel all around the world, basically. Um, and uh, that was actually nothing that kings could do 200 years ago even. Now, however, since about 200 years, we've observed tremendous increases in individual, but also social well-being due mainly to technological progress and um, an improvement in health and in uh, living standards. So nowadays, we are able to enjoy high living standards and good health very much into old age. And we enjoy things that nobody would have dared to imagine just a few generations ago. Now, in the lectures on the solo model, the uh, research and development based growth models and so on, we have analyzed the driving forces of these uh, developments and have worked out basically uh, the role of capital accumulation, human capital accumulation, innovation and invention and uh, efficiency. And now we want to ask in these uh, three uh, parts of the lecture, what policymakers can do to support an increase in well-being and to foster economic growth. Before we start with this discussion, it's important to clarify one aspect with respect to the terminology. And there it is the case that um, policymakers and also the media often refer to certain policies or cash handouts and even interest changes of the central bank as growth promoting. So, for example, that the government hands out cash in order to promote economic growth or um, the central bank decreases the interest rate to boost economic growth. Usually, however, these policies are rather meant to stabilize the business cycle. So they are not really growth promoting policies, but stabilization policies. And um, here in this chapter, we really refer to growth promoting policies that change the economy in the long run, that change the structure of the economy and that have impacts on economic growth, not only over a few quarters, but really over years and even decades and yeah, some even over centuries, of course. Throughout my lectures on the solo model, the neoclassical growth model, uh, models with human capital accumulation, and particularly models of long run economic growth driven by purposeful research and development investments, we have seen that the following four aspects are particularly important in order to determine long run economic growth. The first is physical capital accumulation, so building up the capital stock, the productive capital stock in an economy, the number of machines, of production halls, facilities, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And that's determined usually by private and public investment. And so the government 
can influence that by its own public investment decisions, of course, but also in terms of uh, tax credits for investment and uh, subsidies for investment. And capital accumulation can particularly affect economic growth in the medium run, so for uh, a few decades, for example. The second aspect here are efficiency boosting reforms, where we have seen that if you increase efficiency in an economy, you bring the economy closer to the production possibilities frontier, and that leads to an increase in income, so you can also foster economic growth in the medium run. But in the long run, of course, at some point you hit the production possibilities frontier and then only policies that shift the production possibility frontier outside, they can promote long run economic growth. And th these would be the policies that foster technological progress. However, efficiency boosting reforms, as I said, can be very important in the medium run. And these policies comprise, for example, cracking down on corruption, reducing bureaucratic barriers, uh, improving the flexibility of markets, and so on and so forth. The third aspect here is education and human capital accumulation. And education can foster productivity and economic growth in particularly in the medium run by um, making people more productive. So if people are better educated, they are typically more productive on the labor market. That's a direct effect of education and human capital accumulation. But education and human capital accumulation also have a very important indirect effect, namely that they promote uh, technological progress because technological progress is determined by well-educated scientists and engineers and so on and so forth. And only if you have a um, functioning education system in a country, uh, you can really educate the next generation of uh, scientists, engineers and so on and so forth. And that leads directly to the fourth item on the list. Uh, and that's the main driving force of long-run economic growth, that is technological progress through innovation and invention. And of course, also here, the government has many different policies how it can influence innovation and invention. In the parts uh, two and part uh, and, and three, I will go more into the details of uh, particular policies. Um, and here, this is just a first brief overview of the most important aspects. So what I will do in the following parts is to discuss these detailed policies, particularly uh, structured according to the four items that I've uh, just presented. And some of them will be rather conventional policies, such as tax credits when a firm invests and so on. Some may be new, uh, such as uh, alternatives or complements to the patent system in order to foster uh, innovation and invention. And I will first focus on capital accumulation, on promoting efficiency and on promoting human capital accumulation through education in part two. And in part three, I will focus in more detail actually what can be done to foster innovation and invention.